Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. One of my favorite songs. Amen. I don't know about you. Amen. Reminder of just how much we need him to fill us. Amen. Yes. Amen. Fill us with all of the fullness of who he is. We praise God for his presence here with us today. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we prepare to open the word of God and to see what the Lord has to say, for us. say to us. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for always being willing to filling us. Even when our emptiness is a result of our own sin and selfishness, we can still come to you and ask for forgiveness and be completely filled again. Lord, we thank you for your love for us, God, because your love for us is not based on our performance. It's based on who you are. And so, Lord, we thank you for your incredible love. Lord, we thank you for your word that you have given to us so that we might know you, so that we can know what it means to be ready to see you. And so, Lord, today I pray against the enemy who will cause us to not be able to receive your word today, who will cause us to be burdened with the cares of this life, that we will not be able to receive what your spirit is seeking to say to us. So, Lord, give us humble and open hearts today to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A couple years ago, Lifeway Christian Research, they conducted an online survey of about 1,137 Americans. And the reason why they conducted this survey was that they, it really was an attempt to discover a, what Americans pray for the most. Mm. Interesting results on the survey, you know, I was actually quite surprised at some of the things that I discovered. They say that 82% of the people that they surveyed say that they mostly pray for their family and their friends. That's good, isn't it? That's good news. <laughs> They say that 74%, the next category now, they said 74% of those people, they prayed for their own problems and their difficulties. Then they say 42% of those surveys said that they prayed for their own sins. But what struck me about the survey, interestingly, was what they discovered that while most Americans were praying for their family and their friends and their own circumstances and their own sins, that they also found it important, they also made it a priority to pray for their favorite sports team. <laughs> they were praying that God would somehow intervene and make sure that their team would win the game or win the championship. I don't know about you, but I think I sent up a prayer for the Cubs early on this week. <laughs> and I don't know how many times I prayed for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> oh, no, they're not depending on my prayers because <laughs> they're not working. Amen. Ah. Uh, but it's interesting, they say not only do we pray for that, but they discovered that not only do people pray for their favorite sports teams, but they pray for, uh, they pray to win the lottery. <laughs> it's a priority, you know. I, some of us, anybody here praying to win the lottery? Don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. <laughs> they say people spend time praying for making sure that they don't get a speeding ticket. Hmm? Or they don't get caught while they're speeding, amen. Anybody, I'm running late, I hope, Lord, don't let the police catch me. <laughs> they say they take time to pray for finding that perfect parking space. Hmm? Hmm? Roll, I'm running a little late. I want to park by the door so I can walk right in. Hmm? <laughs> you got some witnesses here today, huh? We got some prayer warriors. And then, then they say that, interestingly, what kind of surprised me, they say that actually some people prayed, a very small percentage, prayed for people to get fired. Anybody ever prayed for one of their coworkers to get fired? <laughs> or you prayed for them to move along, the Lord would open another door for them. Is that what that was your prayer? Amen. <laughs> 
<laughs> they said that some people even prayed for people to fail on their endeavor. Now, I was on, that was a very small, it was only 4% that made that prayer. Amen. But it's interesting, of all the things that they found that people in America find time to pray for, the one thing that stands out to me is going to kind of shape our conversation today, that is that nobody had on their prayer list a prayer for Jesus to come. Mercy. 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 Hmm? Now, they say that they prayed also, a large amount of people prayed for God. They praised God, thanking him for the blessings in their lives. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But there was not a single category where anybody said that they were praying for Jesus to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So today I want to ask, mm -hmm. what are you praying for today? Mercy. Mm -hmm. Mercy. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to you today about how this prayer for Jesus to come, what it means, what it says about our relationship with him, if this is our prayer, but also what it says about where we are, if this is not our prayer. So the title of my sermon today is simply Maranatha. Maranatha. And so I want to unpack that a little bit here today from the book of Revelation. This is actually going to be my final sermon in Revelation. It's going to include, I can't believe it's been two years since we first started preaching in Revelation. But today will be, I will bring a close, a fitting close to the book of Revelation. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter. And I want to start in verse 18 because that kind of gets us to where we want to start for today. And we're going to be looking at a couple verses here in this chapter, but we're going to focus on 18 to 20. Reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. And here's what the Word of God says. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Even so, come, oh, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Yes, sir. Hmm. Now, it's interesting. I love the book of Revelation is that John ends his le letter, he closes out the book in the very much in the same way that he starts the book. He ends the book by talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. That's how he begins in chapter 1, if you remember. And what we discover here in the book of Revelation is that this theme about Jesus' soon return is a central and important theme in the book of Revelation. And, 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 and we begin to see why this is so important because even in this chapter, chapter 22, we see that three times that Jesus says in the letter, in the closing verses, he says, behold, I am coming quickly. In the last 12 verses, Jesus pronounces, declares that he's getting ready to come and that he is coming very soon. It is interesting that in verse 7 we see he says, behold, I'm coming quickly. And then in verse 12 he says, and behold, I'm coming quickly again. And it's interesting that the use of the word in that phrase, that he begins that phrase with the word behold. And the word, the word literally means it's like, a, it's like an abrupt, it's like a sudden cry. And really what Jesus is saying to the, to the readers and those of us sitting here today, he's saying, pay attention. I'm coming quickly. Hmm? It is designed to arrest the attention of the person that is reading this book to the people that are listening to this message today. Jesus says, pay attention. I'm about to come and I'm coming quickly. But when we get down to, to verse 20, he does not use the interjection. Behold, he says, surely 
I'm coming quickly. And so as he begins to end the letter, he switches from pay attention, warning the people, to now answering himself. He says, he now says, surely I am coming quickly. In other words, yes, indeed, I am coming. Mercy. Hmm? And what Jesus is trying to show us in that, in, that sw- in that shift of phraseology is that he wants us to know the certainness and the reliability of his coming. It's like he's excited and he says, behold, pay attention, I'm coming. And it's almost as if he begins to reflect on the reality that he's getting ready to come. And he says, yes, indeed, hmm? I am coming quickly. And we see something, a similar usage of the word surely in the shepherd psalm where, where David says, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. In other words, we see the use of the word surely there. It is to drive home the promise that, that God is trying to drive into our heart. Surely I am coming. And in his word, he reveals That all of us who follow him will receive this promise. Now it's interesting when John hears these words. When John hears these words, I love how he responds. And we're going to see we're getting to the central core message of our message today. When John says that when Jesus says these words, surely I am coming quickly. John says, amen. Mm. He gets excited. He says, even so. Come, come, Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus' words awaken, it strikes a chord in the deep recesses of its souls. It awakens, it, it reminds him of his inner longing, and it creates a sense of excitement as he says to God, even so, God, so let it be. Come. I mean, it's interesting that when Jesus was, was living on, when he was living on the planet Earth, he, one of his teachings was, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Hmm? In other words, that what comes out of our mouth in the moment of our most greatest frustration reveals what's really on the inside of our heart. Oh, you're not with me today. And so John now, when he hears the words, Jesus says, surely I'm coming quickly, out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaketh because what he says now reveals that all along, all his life while he's on the isle of Patmos in exile, all by himself in his heart, he cannot wait for the day when Jesus will come back again. And so when he hears Jesus tell him, surely I'm coming quickly, he gets excited. And really here is coming, it's like a benediction. It is a prayer. He prays it back to God. Oh, God, amen. Even so, Lord, come quickly. And what also reveals another important teaching about Jesus that he says, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Oh, you're not with me today. His treasure was with Jesus, even though he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. His heart was in Jesus' heart, and he was longing for for him to come back again. And so he utters this prayer, even so, come, Lord Jesus. It's interesting, and when Jesus was with the disciples and he wanted to learn how to pray, they asked him, they said, Jesus, how should we pray? And Jesus says to them, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Mm. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says that the person that belongs to me that really wants to pray what I'm concerned about, they pray for the reign of God to come and invade the kingdom of darkness and overturn Satan so that the people of God will come to know him and love him. He says, this is how the people who belong to me pray. They're not just worried about their problems and their needs and their concern. They're most preoccupied. The thing that they want the most to take place is for the kingdom of God to come. Oh, you're not with me today. And so now, 
John takes it to another level. Jesus was talking about the eternal reign, the will of God in the hearts of men in the world. But now John prays and es- prays for the eschatological reign. <laughs> huh? What the theologians call the eschaton, the last thing, eschatological, the end of time. He now plays for the prays for the end time reign of God. Oh, you're not with me today. He is praying for the final eternal reign for God to come. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. That's the content of his prayers. And this prayer is for God to come and once and for all put an end to wickedness and darkness in our world. Praying for the Lord to come. You know, this had become quite an important prayer in the lives of the early Christians. And particularly here in Revelation, because we know the Christians, if you remember, they have been suffering persecution because of their faith. Some people are being boiled alive. Some people are being um, um, persecuted and thrown into prison because of their faith in Christ. And so early on, the Christians, ever since the birth of Christianity, it has always been under persecution of those who reject Christ and his ministry. And so the believers now, when they would gather together, it had become a part of their worship that they prayed for the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's where we get the word Maranatha. It means even so... Come, Lord Jesus. And so whenever they got together, when they were closing out their time together, they would pray this prayer, Maranatha. Because they knew that only Jesus could put an end to their trial, to their suffering, to their heartache. They knew that only Jesus could provide the escape and the deliverance from the powers of darkness. And so whenever they prayed this prayer, it reminded them that one, that Jesus had all things in his hand, that he was coming one day to put an end to their suffering, but it also reminded them of their need to live their lives in harmony with him and his will. So every time they prayed the word, they uttered the prayer, Maranatha, their fears subsided. Uh, Every time they said, even so, Lord Jesus, come, their faith was strengthened for the journey because they knew that their present suffering would not last always, that there was a better day coming and that their Savior was going to come and take them home with them. Maranatha. And so again, I ask the question, what are we praying for today? Hmm? When we say Jesus... I'm just ready for Jesus to come out. Do we really mean that when we say that? Or has that just become a cliche like happy Sabbath these days? Has it lost its meaning? Do we even talk about Maranatha? It's interesting. Our name means seventh day Advent is Advent, the coming of God. And do we even believe in the coming of God anymore? Or have we gotten so comfortable down here with our pursuits in this world that we could care less about when Jesus comes? He can come whenever he gets ready to. He can take as long as he wants. Because I'm enjoying my life down here. Hmm? When you hear the word Maranatha, you know, when I used to hear people say, you know, Maranatha, like, oh, man, those are, those are the extreme fringes of our church. <laughs> but Maranatha, is that our prayer? Hmm? And let me tell you something. How we live our lives, where we focus our attention, reveals whether or not we're so in love with Jesus that we can't wait for him to come. Mm. And how we live our lives and where we focus our attention reveals if our commitment to God is real or if it's just superficial. You see, we can say I'm ready for Jesus to come, but live like we can wait for him to come. Mm. And so what we have is an incongruity. It's a, it's, our lives and our words and our lives are, at a, are, 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 are not in agreement. Uh-huh. Jesus describes an attitude that professes 
you want him to come, but lives another way, he calls that attitude the attitude of the wicked servant. Mercy. Let's go to Luke 12 and keep your hands there. We're going to go there. I want to flesh, flesh this out a little bit. Luke chapter 12, verse 45. And I'm going to kind of condense this parable for the sake of not getting into a whole nother sermon because this whole passage could be a sermon all by itself. But I want to read verse 45, 12 verse 45 of Luke, and notice what he says. Jesus, Jesus is talking now, and we're going to come right to the heart of the story. But he says, but if that servant says in, in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and the female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on that day when he is not looking for him and at that hour when he's not aware and will cut him into two and appoint him his apportion with the unbelievers. That's some strong words from Jesus right there. Lord, help us. Hmm? But I want to focus on what he says. He says, notice the attitude of the servant. He says that my master delays his coming. Literally means that he's taking his time. Hmm? In other words, he believes that his master is not going to come right away. He's been taking so long that he no longer believes that he's really about to come at any moment. And so what happens now, the delay in the extension of time reveals his true colors. All along when he thought the master could come, he was being fair and doing all that the master commanded. But now when he thought that he was taking a long time, he turns and he starts mistreating the other servants. His true colors come to the surface. And it's interesting what it says in verse 47. It says now, verse 47, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. In other words, this servant knew the will of his master, but he decided not to do it. And here's why. He thinks that there is a possibility that he can get away with it. Stay with me now. Hmm? He thinks he knows the will of God, but he thinks that he can get away with it. He thinks that he will have time enough to cover his tracks. You know, last Sabbath, I went to a dinner and two sisters were there and we had an interesting conversation. I don't see either one of them sitting out here today, but... And we had an interesting conversation, and they were telling us all about all of what it was like growing up <laughs> in the home of Thelma Southern. <laughs> I won't say the names of the daughters. I don't know if they're here. So it won't be on the record, <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> and, you know, you have one older daughter who always got into trouble. And admittedly so, she said, she said, I always disobeyed what my, what, my, what my mother told me to do. And she was always getting caught up. And then the younger sister said, I, she turned to her and said, I don't know why she would do that. <laughs> and then the older sister in reflection thought about it and said, you know what? The reason why I did that, because there was always the possibility that I thought I could get away with it. <laughs> It was always the possibility that I wouldn't get caught. We've all been there, right? <laughs> but especially with our parents. Mm -hmm. I remember I used to, my mother would reprimand me, and I'd wait till I was down the hall, around the corner, and she makes me sick. What you say? I thought she had bionic ears or something. <laughs> but how she hear what I'm saying? <laughs> and we think that we're just far enough distance that we can get away with the disobedience that we're not going to get caught and it's not because we don't know the right thing to do we know the right thing to do when it comes to serving God but we think because of his delay that we can get away with our disobedience 
We think that we have time enough to sin against God, to go off onto our own selfish pursuits and have enough time to turn back around and come back to God just in time before he comes back. It's like the child that stays out knowing that their parents are going to come home at 8 o'clock and they stay out all in the streets and they know that they should be in the house. And just at 7.59, they're trying to get in the door, not realizing that their mother came home early that day. Hmm? Thought you could get away with it. And that is how many of us are as it relates to our walk with God. And that was the case with this evil servant. He thought... That he could get away with it. And his master came back not only when he least expected it, but he caught him red-handed. He caught him in the middle of his sin. Let me tell you what happens to that wicked servant. That attitude and that life of that person is, has not, is what will be the same fate of the person who refuses to walk with God and do all of his will. We will get caught right, right, in, the, right, right in the middle of a sin. Hmm? Talk about some exposure. <laughs> you know, some of us got some stuff that we do. We don't want, ever, we don't want anybody to ever find out. <laughs> I got some witnesses behind me, boy. They said, I know that's right. <laughs> Everybody out here looking all sophisticated, but you know. <laughs> I want to go back to Revelation, and this is why this is so important, because and this is what it really puts in the context of our earlier, our earlier scripture reading here in verse, in verse 11, 22 verse 11, and why Jesus says, notice what he says. He says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. He puts together two categories. He first starts, the word for the unjust is the evil. He who is an evildoer, he who practices doing wrong in, in rebellion against God and his will and his commandments, he says, let him continue in his rebellion. Hmm. He said, let the person who is filthy, the person that is unrestrained in their passions and do everything that they want to do, even though they know that it's not according to the will of God. He says, let them be filthy still. And what Jesus is saying is that the person that is in the habit of practicing a life away from God, that they will get stuck in that life and they will come to the place in their experience where they will be beyond the redemption of Jesus Christ. So the person that, that John is highlighting that Jesus is bringing to our attention is for the person that persists in sin and rebellion. In other words, there will come a time in our journey with God where it will no longer be possible for us to turn away from our sin. Can you imagine that? That's when you know you've gone too far. When sin no longer troubles your conscience. Hmm? When you come to the place where you no longer have any desire. You know, there's some sins that when you first started doing, you felt guilty when you did it. <laughs> mm, now I know I'm about to mess with some of y'all. But then you started doing it, and the, some, the thing that, is, that you, you, you're doing it now, and you have forgotten how guilty and how sinful it was when you first started. And if that can happen now, while mercy still intercedes, what happens when Jesus closes the books and says, he who is filthy, let him be filthy. But he says, but who is righteous? I love it. Who is righteous is the person that is in a loving relationship with God. He says he was righteous is, um, um, and holy is the person that, that, is, that, that, that their life is in conformity to the will and the purposes of God. They're completely devoted to him in everything. There's nothing in their life that's off limits for him. This person, when he talks about being holy, he's talking about consecrating the life to God. Yes. Being a living sacrifice that God can consume. And he says, the person that lives their life in this way, he says, 
will continue in that state. You know, we think about, you know, you always, you often hear this, that the, you know, the only thing that we're going to take to heaven is our character. Mm. Mm. You're not going to take your, your favorite dress, your favorite hat, your nice suit, your favorite electronic, your large flat screen TV. You're, you're not going to take it. Your ride, you're not taking it. What you're taking, the only thing that Jesus is going to be looking for, when the only thing that's going to matter is who you are on the inside. And right now, all of the choices and the decisions, all of the things that we're doing in our lives now, we're either coming closer to God or we're coming less like him. We're either being transformed into his glory and into his character and into his image, or we're becoming more and more not like him. And so we think that a lot of things in life, that they're just neutral, that it doesn't really matter if I do this or I don't do that. But we don't understand that some things in life, there's nothing neutral in this world. And that the idea that there's some things that even though they're not inherently sinful, they dull the spiritual perceptions. Yes. It weakens us to choose God when we need to choose him. The person who can continue in a state of righteousness and holiness is because their life would have been evidenced of a life in communion and fellowship with God. The reason why John, John stresses this importance, that's, I'm sorry, let me say it another way. The reason why John, we're going to discover here, he stresses the importance of revelation because he understands what's at stake. Hmm? This book contains the end of all things. He lets us know it's the, the book is a message of now when truth becomes a lie and lie becomes the truth. Mercy. We're seeing it happen right before our very eyes. Just turn on the television screen. Mercy. <laughs> At any given moment, turn to CNN, MSNBC, and you will see lies becoming true. Mm. Yes, sir. Hmm? And so John is letting us know how important this message is. Let's look what he says in, in, in verse 7 of the book. When he says, behold, I am coming quickly. Notice what he says. Blessed is he who keeps the word of this prophecy, of this book. In other words, the person that takes to heart the message of revelation will be kept from the final deception. This person, this is what it means to be blessed. We never think about being blessed from being, being kept from deception. Uh -uh. Now, we think about being blessed in other ways. Huh? But here, the word of God, when it talks about blessing, it's a blessing to not be deceived. And that's good news. That means I'm not going to be in a lake of fire. <laughs> and that's why he says in verse 10, look what he says in verse 10. He says, and he says, he goes on, he said, he said to me, do not seal the words of this prophet. Do not keep this book secret. Mercy. Oh, you're not with me today. He says, for the time is at hand. He says, don't try to put the contents or sugarcoat them or downplay them or never open them and never explain them. He says, don't seal them. Let everybody know because the time is at hand. Jesus is getting ready to come. That's how important this message is. And the person that takes seriously the message of revelation will be saved in Christ's Thank kingdom. You. Thank you, Lord. Hmm? Isn't that good news? Keep your hands there. I want to go. I'm almost done. I want to go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And if we remember in Daniel chapter 12, when the message, when Daniel was revealed to Daniel, the prophet Daniel, the angel said in verse 4, Daniel 12, verse 4, he tells him to seal up the book. <laughs> he says in verse 4, are we there? He says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. But then he tells us also, he lets Daniel know what's going to happen when the book is opened. Notice what he says now in verse 10. He says, many shall be purified made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, 
and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Notice that now. So when the word of God is preached, what we will often minimize is that when the word of God is preached, it separates the sheep from the goats. It separates light from darkness. It exposes what's really inside of our hearts. And some of us, when we hear the word of God and the truth of God, we respond in faith and we're purified. But the person that does not receive or respond to the truth of the message of the last time, that person continues in wickedness. And notice what he says. They will not understand. In other words, they will not be able to discern the times. Oh, you're not with me today. That's why obedience to God's will is so important. Because as we walk in his will, we get stronger in faith and spirit and in spiritual perception. But if we are disobedient to him, we're walking in darkness and we're not able to see as clearly as we ought. We don't understand that sin has a deluding influence. It blinds us. When you're in a sinful situation, a sinful relationship in rebellion against God, you don't know the up from down, east from west, north from south. You think you do. (laughs) But let me tell you right now, you don't. Sin causes us to not to be able to understand. Those who do not have a heart to serve God will be, uh, be exposed because the word of God makes it clear what light is and what darkness is. But those of us who I love how Paul uses these words, who love his appearing. He says, but for those of us who respond in faith to God's word, to those of us who are preoccupied with his coming, who who wake up in the morning thinking about him, who go to bed at night thinking about him, his will and his way and how you can bring your life into conformity to him. He said, this person who loves his appearing, he says, there is a crown of righteousness. Oh, you're not with me. Laid up in heaven for me. In other words, that God has your crown sitting there in heaven with your name on it. Oh, you're not with me today. What's the song? I got a car with my name on it. No, I got a crown with my name on it. Oh, you're not with me today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But it's only for those who love his appearing. Mm. (laughs) You love his appearing in the morning when you get up and you turn your face towards him and you fall on your knees. You love his appearing every time you walk through these doors for Sabbath school, for prayer meeting, for ministry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A crown is waiting for those who love his appearing, who puts their faith in him more than their pursuits in this life and in this world. He says, this person has a crown laid up in heaven. Oh, you're not with me. Mm, I wish I'd have had time to look that word up, laid up. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but whatever it means, it's a good thing. It means it's being stored. It's being kept for me. Mm. Those who love his, appearing, he love his appearing and can't wait for him to come, they pray the same prayer as John. Amen. Even so, come. Mm. Lord Jesus. Mm. Those who love, that's their prayer. I want that to be my prayer. Lord, I want the Lord to deliver me from everything this world has to offer. The approval of man, success, whatever that may be. I want the Lord to bring me to the place that all I'm concerned about is for him to come. The person that prays this prayer, who prays Maranatha, they know that this world is not their home. You're not with me today. Hmm? They're looking, and the Hebrew writer says, for a world where the builder and maker is God. In other words, they're looking for a world where the architect, the man that came up with the design, the being that came up with the design is God himself. That's the person that loves his appearing. Mm. The person that prays this prayer 
is looking forward to a world where there's no more death. There's no more sorrow. There's no more fear. There's no more worry. Why? Because John says, God will be their light. So you know, when we get to heaven, we're not going to need the sun, the moon, or the stars. Because Jesus, the glory of God in the face of Jesus will shine so brightly that we will be able to bask in his presence forever. The person who prays Amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus, has a better home, and it's in heaven. Is that your prayer today? You want that to be your prayer? Hmm? Share a story of, I'm sure it's a popular story, I'm pretty sure many of us have heard it, a story of a two missionary, a husband and wife missionary team coming back home from Africa after spending years on the mission field. And they're coming home in the time they're actually taking a boat from Africa and they just happened to be on a boat with then President Theodore Roosevelt, who was coming from an African expedition. He'd been out in the wild hunting. And there's all kind of fanfare. Everyone's celebrating the President of the United States. People just can't stop taking pictures of them. And nobody notices this poor little missionary couple that had been working for God all those years. They're coming back to America. They're headed to New York. They don't have a pension. Their health is not what it once was. They've, been on a, they've, they've expended themselves that they're no longer as physically fit and able as they once were. And they really don't know that when they get to New York, what's going to happen next? So while they're traveling on the, on the, on the boat across the ocean, the, the husband, he gets frustrated and he, he says, you know, it's not fair. Everybody says to his wife, that everyone's making all this big fuss about Theodore Roosevelt. All he did was go hunting and everybody's paying attention to him. He finally made it back to the shores of New York. Husband's still troubled. They found themselves. They went looking for a home. They found a little apartment. And the next day, when they settled in that night, they were thinking the next day he was going to go out and try to find a job because they didn't know how they were going to support themselves. And that night, the husband sat there and looked at his wife, and he got really frustrated. And he said to his wife, he says, this is just not fair. Why would God allow this to happen to us? His wife looked at him. She said, well, why don't you go in your room in your prayer closet? And tell Jesus all about it. Hmm. <laughs> he got up and he went inside his prayer closet. He was in there for quite some time. And when he came out, he was not the husband he was when he went in. He came out excited. She said, what happened to you? She said, well, he said, I was praying to God. And I was telling him all about how it's just not fair. And he said to me, well, son, this world is not your home. Some of us, he, we're not that excited, are we? <laughs> huh? He says, in other words, he says, don't worry. Theodore can get all that he wants, all the fanfare. But let me tell you something. This world is not your home. You've got a home with a mansion, with a crown. You have eternal life. The streets are paved with gold. Oh, you're not with me today. This world is not our home. Even so, Lord, come so we can go home. Mm. Mm. That's our prayer today. And so for the person today that wants to go home with Jesus, mm, and you've never, maybe you've never given your heart to him, never given, said, Lord, I trust you. Or maybe you have wandered away from him. And today you want to come back to him and say, Lord, I surrender. I want you not only to come again, but I want you to come in my heart and live inside of me. 
If that is your prayer, that's your desire today. I want to invite you to get up out of your seat, slip out of the aisle, and come down to the altar today. We're going to pray for you. We're going to receive you. We're going to love you. We're going to connect you with individuals who are going to nurture you and walk with you on the journey, teach you the word of God, how to, how to live in him, how to walk with him, how to never go back to the life to how it used to be. If this is your desire today and you want to come fully into the heart of Jesus, you want him to come into sight of you, I invite you to slip out of your seat and come down and receive him today. You want to be baptized. You want to grow. You want him to come. In, you want to come back to him. If this is your desire today, we want to invite you to come. Are you here? Lord God, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven is not my home, then Lord, what shall I do? Yes. The angels are beckoning me yes. from heaven's open doors. Yes. That's why I can't, I can't feel, feel at home in this world. bowed, every eye is closed. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you will cause us to not be comfortable down here. Yes, God. Yes. May we not in any way see this world as our home. Oh, yes. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that reminds us that you're coming, the promise of your coming. May we see your coming as an opportunity to live with you forever in eternity to be free from all of the trials yes, God. down here. Yes. Yes, God. Lord, we want to live in the world and the earth made new. Yes. We want to live with you. We want to see you face to face. Yes. Yes, and so, Lord, I pray that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, may we not use this time of waiting to do what we want to do. But may we see how important it is to bring our lives in conformity to you by faith. Give us your grace, God. We need your grace. We need your grace to keep us. Your grace in our hearts. Give us the faith to trust you. To see you as our all and all. Lord, I pray for every person in here today. Lord, you know us. You know why we are the way we are, yeah. where we are in relationship with you. Yeah. And so, Lord, today, convict us of sin yes, yes, Lord. Yes, and convict us of your love yes, and your ability to cleanse us yes. and keep us from sin. Yes, Lord. Yes. Keep us, we pray. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Strafford, several weeks ago, we passed out a form for every ministry leader encouraging and asking you to get your team together so we all can come out next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock to do a fall church cleanup. You were requested to return those forms on today. Does anyone have their form? You can please see me. And it's not too late to encourage your friends, your neighbors, <laughs> your children to come out next Sunday morning at Nine o'clock, we need to clean up our home church. We have been blessed. Amen. Amen. We have been blessed Amen. with this sanctuary, but we do need to clean up a little bit, and we need your help. Men, women, children, everybody. Let's come out at nine. Let's get together, and we can all go home, but we all sit in here on Sabbath. We all use the washroom. We all need to come and help clean up our home church. In amen. Jesus' name, amen. 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 I don't know about you on this day, but my soul was blessed on this day. We thank God for his message and for his messenger. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Our benediction, God's word says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever, as John said, amen. 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 I'm asking for all the choir members from all the